Influence, the global podcast that shines a spotlight on the influencer marketing industry. Welcome to Influence, the global podcast that shines a spotlight on the influencer marketing industry. I'm Gordon Glenister, and in this edition, we're going to be talking about virtual influencers with my special guest, Dudley Neville Spencer. But before we do that, I began delving into the subject a little bit more. Influencer analyst Hype Auditor did some research back in 2019 on the effects of virtual influencers, and it found 23% of virtual influencer audiences come from the States, followed by Brazil and Russia. Uh, Lil Michaela, who's one of the top virtual influencers, has an audience of over 2 million followers. Beside her Instagram account, she has released several music singles and has a very successful YouTube channel now with over 8 million views. She's also listed among Time's most influential people on the internet in 2018. The Hype Auditor survey also highlighted the engagement rates amongst virtual influencers are often seen as much higher, particularly at the 1 to 5,000 follower rate, like it was 12% compared to 5% for real influencers. So uh, anyway, interesting stuff. That said, let's introduce my next guest, who is a highly regarded figure in the influencer marketing community, uh, is named as one of the top 50 individuals in the world of influencer marketing. Uh, Dudley is an innovation pioneer, starting in influencer marketing back in 2006 and creating one of the first influencer tools to marry brands and influencers by values and interests. Dudley regularly speaks about his chosen subject and has appeared on stage at a number of industry events. He's also the founder of the Virtual Influencer Agency and the Director of Strategy at Live and Breathe. So when we had a chat, I wanted to ask him how it all began. My first job was when I was 19. I actually started investment banking as a futures trader, which people often say, how is that related to what you do now? But actually, I, I think it's very similar because back then what I was trying to do was get a whole bunch of information and try and figure out how people were going to feel next. And that's effectively what I do when it comes to either strategy or innovation or virtual influencer marketing, because you're effectively trying to figure out a particular consumer and you're trying to create content and character for them which delivers the right kind of message for a particular brand. Um, and you do that through analysing a whole bunch of information to understand the psychology of the consumer. So I see it as actually very, very similar. I didn't realise that until my mother pointed it out, I should say. So you're sort of seen as this CGI expert in the industry somewhat, aren't you? What do people understand by CGI? The way to look at it is like this. So there are computer-generated images, which we all know and understand, everything from cartoon characters to um, to films like Avatar, etc. But when we're talking in influencer marketing about CGI characters or virtual influencers, there are effectively three kinds. So the first one is a human looking character. It could be moving in video um, or it could be a still life character. And those are characters that can be used by brands to uh, conduct very simple customer service type jobs so you might be booking for an airline or ANZ Bank in Australia has one and it's a character you actually talk to talks back to you looks like a human but actually it's a computer generated image so there's a customer service more and more of them are, uh, are starting to appear and that's mainly because of machine learning and neural networking which really became usable in 2015 with Jeffrey Hinton and the advent of big data and the ability to transfer lots of information really quickly, it meant that you could actually start to have conversations with CGI characters, which seemed quite real. And so that's why they've started to grow in importance. But then the second type, um, so there's basically customer service, then the second type uh, are those which are created by creators as characters in their own right. So that's characters like Little Michaela. There are loads of other ones, Kate Harper, a 14 year old kid, um, there is Ion Gottlick, you know, a bike racer who's with a, an international bike racing team. And they're effectively made by creators to make money. So they are effectively made by creators to become celebrities in their own right. Uh, and then the third kind, which is the kind which I tend to focus on, are ones made on behalf of brands to have a relationship with a consumer. So those are ones that are owned by brands that are targeting a particular market or a particular 
target consumer and we create them to appeal to that consumer and allow the consumer to have an emotional relationship with the brand, which to date has been pretty much impossible or you had to do it through somebody else who you knew wasn't the brand like a an advocate or a uh, or a celebrity so give me an example of one if you have a look at ion gotlick i-o-n-g-o-t-t-l-i-c-h he's got fifty four thousand followers and effectively he is a character that is uh, sponsored by bora hansgrohe which is a german tap and shower manufacturer and their big sponsorship deal is with a cycle racing team. And he's this huge, muscly character that rides around in CGI, obviously, with a world champion bike rider who's a guy called Peter Sagan. But that's a really interesting one because you see the world champion bike rider, Peter Sagan, and then you see Iron Gottlieb next to him uh, riding along, having fun. Uh, and that's worked incredibly well. It's because it's such a very specific niche, which in, in this case is road racing, road mm. cycle racing. Uh, it's it's a real niche. And so people absolutely love this character because it, obviously he clearly understands um, road cycling. He's hanging out with the world champion. Um, he's talking about all the issues around road racing. He's quite funny as well. Um, you see him do strength training. You see him <laughs> do all kinds of things that a real character would do you also see him on Eurosport being interviewed by the Eurosport characters so when people sort of say oh, I don't understand the uses of this I mean the reality is that it's going to be any niche you'll end up having virtual influencers in because there are so many advantages to, to having them that you're going to end up seeing them everywhere I mean is there a worry then that they replace real influencers I don't think they'll replace them at all I think what will happen is as the influence market grows you'll just see these ones grow as well yeah uh, and they'll grow significantly. So, you know, I don't see it as being something which takes over the, the industry. I see it as a whole new industry. And, and really, that's all part of the, the coming immersive Internet. So what we have to realise is that we will be interacting with the Internet through immersive structures and immersive technologies. Mm. So at the moment, you think of augmented reality where you hold up your phone and it overlays something in real life. We're starting to see a lot of eyewear, so it looks look like glasses which overlay um, the internet onto the real world around you and mm. you'll start to have characters which you can interact with and that will be the way that we will mainly engage with the internet within the next decade is through virtual characters as opposed to typing something into google or doing a traditional search we will actually ask companies that are characters um, and we will have relationships with characters owned by companies um, and we will also have relationships with entertainment units so in the same way that we might watch a film and suspend disbelief and cry when our character gets hurt, even though we know it's not true. Well, we'll have relationships with virtual influencers like that in the form of entertainment as well. Do you see virtual influencers as working particularly well in, in niches or is it very relevant to certain buckets or certain genres? It's kind of niche at the moment. I mean, the most famous one is, of course, little Michaela and she's kind of left wing LGBTQ issues based. But it works very, very well for niches because you can craft the character to ensure that it responds to that niche. And that's one of the big attractions of it. You can target that particular market which you want to with the right language, which you know resonates, with the right content and visuals you know that resonate, with the right narrative and the right story uh, that resonates. So when it comes to niche marketing, it's very, very good for doing that. Uh, and that's the most obvious place to have it. But it doesn't, it doesn't have to be like that. It just makes things very, very easy if you are targeting particular niches or particular tribes so um just so that i'm clear a virtual influencer is largely owned by a brand it's not something that another brand could buy into and in the way that you could buy and work with a specific influencer well there are a couple of kinds so the ones that we tend to do are ones that are owned by the brand but there are virtual influencers for hire that's for sure and there are loads and loads and loads of you know great friends i have that have created fantastic characters some with 5,000, some with 50,000 followers, and they're doing brand deals, you know, all the time. And and how does that work in terms of um, cost? Is it more expensive? Is it cheaper uh, on a parity or what? Well, at the moment, it's a mix. What you have to realize about it is that the difference is that you might give a brief to a traditional influencer, but then, they're, you know, they're going to create it in their own style or whatever. But the difference with a VI is you can have a narrative and a story. 
So the traditional posts, you know, sticking something in a, in a post which is in the corner or just shouting something out, cost is pretty much the same. Um, there isn't really much of a difference. Where the money's really good, as in uh, it, it can become quite expensive, is when you create, you know, a multi-week story based around the character in your product. So a good example of one of the ones that we're working on at the moment is for a lipstick brand. And we're creating this whole story around uh, this relationship between this younger sister who has an older sister who's really, really, really cool. Anyway, a bunch of things happen. She thinks her boyfriend's cheating on her because there's lipstick on his collar. And then she finds out it's actually from um, this older sister. <laughs> and it's from being gifted this makeup at this really cool launch party. And then she discovers it and makes it her own products. So That's a long narrative. That starts to become a bit expensive, but it also becomes arguably more powerful than anything because yeah. Yeah. It, it's a full story which your audience has become engaged with over a period of weeks. And that's really exciting. And of course, when she discovers that this product is actually, you know, lipstick of her sister, it's the night of the launch. Her sister had been gifting it earlier because she's so cool. And so it's a whole. So that is proper, proper co-creation of a, of, a, of a narrative. It's still so new that brands are trying to get their head around it. And when we sell that into them, they think the idea is fantastic. But then, yeah, you know, it's, it's so new, it's difficult for them to jump. Or if we then present to their advertising agency and talk about it, they just can't get their head around it. We say one third data scientists, we're, we're one third influencer marketers, and we're one third filmmakers. And, and potentially, I guess this is much more has much more global res- resonance, doesn't it? it? It depends on the target market again. Okay. So the, the you know the bit in the beginning I said one third data scientists is because the first thing we do is we say you have to tell us who your market is. You have to show us who they are to understand their psychographics. You have to know who you're targeting. This is not like trying to find someone that fits. This is creating someone to fit. (laughs) So we need to know what that fit is. So then, therefore, the language that they speak and how they look and their background and their history and their age and their friendship and their education and their way they speak and their language and their key life moments, their problems, are mm. they an orphan? That, that is all something which we then go in and create. It's classic mood board stuff, isn't it? It's, it's it uh, you know, it the is. fact that you, 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 marketeers, when they're designing and creating a product, they, they, they're creating a really a good mood board. And then all of a sudden you can create an influencer on the back of that, can't you? That's, that's it, you know. And, you know, one thing we like to do, we have this system Um, called data kinetics which is effectively it takes data from different data points and overlays them it creates interoperability of data and so what it allows us to do is quite often with some of the brands we will actually be doing data analysis of their market and their tribes for them because Mm. they might not have gone into into the psychographics or into the image resonance as much as we want to because we have to determine what kind of content should be created and then obviously pitch it back to them Mm. so we'll often do this analysis of their audience through our data kinetic system and they'll look at it and think oh my god that's that's incredibly deep but we need that if if we're going to create a character from scratch for them what other types of uh, influencer have you seen what trends have you seen develop in the time that you've been involved in this well the the, the most recent trend is the soft touch so there are brands like essence cosmetics who have created their own virtual influencer character who is an intern at essence cosmetics and her name is kenna so if you go to this is dot Kenna, K-E-N-N-A, you'll see her. And so she is effectively a brand creating a character which they own. Well, they haven't given her a massive backstory or anything like that. So she's effectively, it's one more than being a customer service character with a personality. You know, this is a character um, who talks about the product, you know, who you see going out a little bit, mainly within the um, offices of Essence. Mm. Um, but, you know, you do see her partying a little bit. You see her with some friends. You see her going on a holiday, going on vacation, talking to other staff members, that kind of thing. That's what we're starting to see now. That's where I think we're going to trend over the next two to three years. You're going to start to see makeup brands in particular and skincare create characters that either work for them or are either their ambassador 
um, who might perhaps be on their skincare website who you will talk to and when you tell them what kind of skin you have and what your colouring is, they will tell you what you should wear or not wear or you might take a photograph and it you know, maps your face and tells you what makeup you should wear and that character will then interact with you. Mm. That's definitely big. We think within the next three years, every major, every major makeup company will have a virtual influencer character that does exactly that. Some of them will then take them a step further and then we'll have them as characters that have their own lives and go to parties and that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, you've got to pull it back to it. Sounds weird. You've got to pull it back to this. That character is having is going to have thousands of conversations with real consumers, and those yeah. consumers are going to suspend disbelief and have a relationship with a character that is owned by a corporate. Brand. That's extremely powerful. It's never happened before. So it sounds weird, but when you take it back to its roots, it's actually really powerful. And then another thing that people say is, oh, I would never talk to a machine. It's just like, well, that's rubbish. You know, uti utility wins. It was something I used to have to defend a couple of years ago, and I don't even bother defending it now. Mm. You know, the point is, if something is useful, so if that is that, if if in this case it fulfills you emotionally, you know, by having a character that has a, a background and a story that you resonate with. Um, then you'll use it. If it uh, has utility because it's helping you put the right kind of makeup on, you'll use it. So utility always wins. And people, particularly under 25, they don't even think it's weird to talk to uh, a virtual character. I mean, and that's a good point, actually. Um, is it is this age specific? So are there are there um, more younger people that are interacting with that, or you know, fifty plus uh, individuals? Are they going to be um, fairly dismissive of it? The short answer to that is yes and yes. That's the short answer. But like anything with uptake, it normally starts with younger with the young. Now. This, this industry is biggest in Japan. Uh, in Japan, they've got over 7,000 virtual influencers that are on YouTube. Now, are they mainly, really? My God. Yep. Yeah, there's about 1,200 around the rest of the world. Now, mainly the way they work is through facial mapping technology, where it's a real person who's taken on a character. But they're really, really popular. That's a cultural thing there, because mm. Japan has no issue with having relationships with robots. They just don't have an issue with it. It's not part of their culture. So the, the take up there in, in there is, is very big. But in the in the West in particular, yes, it is definitely at the moment more of a young person's game. But in my experience, what I found is this. The moment someone finds a VI that resonates with them sure. and they have a conversation with them, no matter what age, that's it. They're hooked um, and they're off. You know, it's like the first time maybe you, you know, saw a film or something. Like the concept of watching a film is, just, is crazy. Oh, it's a made up story with moving pictures and, you know, it's, you're going to be emotionally connected to it. That just sounds crazy. For a couple of years there, there wasn't anything positive said about VIs. And, and one of the key issues was that the industry saying, you know, the whole point of influencer marketing is authenticity. Mm. Well, firstly, I think that's total rubbish. It's not, and this is something, you know, I've been in it since 2008. It can be about authenticity. It can be about wanting someone who gives you an unfiltered opinion, or it can be about following someone whose lifestyle you want and who looks great. So all of the lifestyle influences, there's zero authenticity to them. They mm. have a completely uh, a made up life. Uh, they present themselves in a way which isn't real, mm. uh, but you like their lifestyle and their look, but there's zero authenticity. So yeah, fair point. But, yeah, yeah, but you said, but that's not what you're going to that person for. It's like trust. You know, people talk about influencer marketing has to be about trust. No, it doesn't. It can be. You know, and 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 that's great when it. You know, when you as a brand you want to gain people's trust, but as a brand you might actually be hiring someone because you want them to aspire to to use your brand, and therefore you create a, a false environment, a false look through a lifestyle mm. influencer. So it depends what you're trying to achieve. Now, with virtual influencers, it's exactly the same. Number one, you should never try and deceive. You should always have hashtag virtual influencer or we have hashtag robot. And that means that, you know, hopefully you know that this is not a real character. But then if you get utility from it because you are having a relationship with it, either because you like the things it's showing you or because you like the emotional side of the character and what it's doing for you, then the utility is there. So who's doing the engagement then as a person behind the account, the Instagram account? Yeah, we have, exactly. We have different people, teams of people that do that. Yeah. But at the moment, what we're, what we're working on, which is the really exciting bit, particularly for me because I'm such a tech guy, is the natural language processing. So we're working with some, some, some fantastic people, some leaders in the world who are – we are co-creating – uh, natural language processing which enables us to create personality based characters where you talk to them on instagram they talk back to you but it's actually a machine hmm. and the reality of that is that 
the advantage is that we want to be able to have, you know, a thousand concurrent conversations at once so that we can scale it up. And natural language processing, you could talk about chatbots. Chatbots are a very, very stripped down version of that. Chatbots are effectively conversation trees, whereas what we're talking about is a lot more complex than that. I mean, chatbots are conversation trees. If someone says this, you say that, and that's it. That's really all they are. Mm. You know, people try and put a, a clever filter over the top of it. Over the top of that, you need some natural language processing and some really strong machine learning to, to create a personality and a character. And that's what we're working on. And so one of the things we're doing, which goes back to that data kinetics, is we're taking millions of conversations from real people who have the psychographic profile of the virtual influence we want to create. So they have a certain level of neuroticism, a certain level of agreeableness, a certain level of openness. And then we're extracting and putting together all of those conversations and sentence structures, breaking them down into segments, and then using those to create a personality-based um, character language for specific characters for brands. Now that is really exciting and it's taking a long time to get right. Uh, I think within the next six months, we'll be launching our first one, which is mainly artificially intelligence conversation driven. If somebody's looking at a campaign that has never used a virtual influencer before, and often, of course, no campaign will just use one influencer in isolation, they'll often use a bunch of them. Uh, what would your view be about uh, mixing traditional influencers with virtual influencers on the same campaign? Well, you know, really... A really good one for that is Samsung with Lil Michaela. We worked with uh, with their representatives for six months, creating a character on behalf of Samsung for the launch of one of their phones. And in the end, they decided to use uh, Michaela instead, which is fine. And it was the launch of the Galaxy S10, but they used a whole series of different influencers, one of which was Lil Michaela. And and did they? But presumably, they were all measured against the same. Uh, metrics um how did how did Michaela do against the um the, you know the real life versions <laughs> do you know it's a really good question uh, so they had um people like steve aoki you know the dj yeah um they had millie bobby brown from stranger things and little Michaela, a couple of gamers all kinds of different people they had a uh, ninja you know the streamer who plays fortnite and gets paid to do it oh yeah so they yeah had a whole different group of people uh, do what you can't that's what it was called hashtag do what you can't i don't know is the answer in terms of the in terms of how well comparatively what i do know is on the work which we've done when you compare the vis to traditional um, influencers is that engagement rates are definitely higher mm. there's no doubt about that um sig significantly higher uh, and I think a large reason for that is because at the moment, if you are going to follow a VI, then you are motivated to do it. It's not a random follow. Mm. It's not a, oh, I'm going to have a look. You, you're either in it or you're not in yeah, it. Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah. yeah. So the consumer tends to engage a lot more at, well, at the moment. I mean, that might level off. It might all blend in together, but it's certainly been that way for the last couple of years. Well, there's also less competition, isn't there? Because suddenly if you see a VI, um, you, you know, there's, as you said, other than Japan, there aren't that many of them ar around. So I would imagine that you that you would either engage and follow them or, or not. Um, whereas right. th there are lots I, of influences. You're right. And the other thing is that for any brand that uses one right now, they get loads of press around it because people still think it's weird. Right. So, okay. so, it's, so you... you <laughs> So you get a lot of really good benefits and you still get that thing of, oh, come and check this person out. It's a robot or whatever. Mm. So it gets shared more. So there's a lot of advantages to it, particularly at the moment. I was highly motivated to make sure that this industry doesn't get hijacked for bad in the same way that effectively a lot of social media did. Mm. And again, you know, I've been in this a long time and I watched social platforms go from being a wonderful place to, to grow ideas to being the most awful tool that's been used by nefarious individuals and nefarious governments to, to disseminate false information to create chaos and so the my idea with after you know speaking with the asa and with easa who were their umbrella body the european advertising standards um, alliance and, and other and other groups you know and yes, there's yes. No official there's no formal relationship between the two but i value what they 
their opinion a lot and you know they've asked you know us where where you know where do we think this is going in terms of from an advertising point of view because effectively mm. this is a brand advertising relationship a lot of the time mm, mm. and so what i've come up with is a series called abc so effectively what we want to do is watermark characters where a is that this virtual influencer is actually an avatar of a real person so you know that you are talking to someone who is a real person but that real person has to be uh, traced so that you don't have trolling because one thing is it's it's becoming easier to make uh, to make an avatar and and talk as someone else and we don't want to see the trolling happen and trolling really happens where people have an anonymity so the idea is that it's blockchain and you can trace and know who you're talking to yeah absolutely and then the second one is b for brand so as in this is owned by a brand so i know that this watermark with a B on it means it's owned by a brand and therefore they're trying to sell me something. Mm. You know, I might have a great relationship with this character, it might be a lot of fun, they might have a fascinating story, but it's a, it's owned by a brand. Mm. So they are trying to have a relationship with me to sell something. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is C for creator. So a creator has made this character because, again, you know, it's something that they, uh, they have an ulterior motive, which is to make money or create, uh, you know, awareness. So, again, I know the reasons that this character that I'm talking to has been created. Hmm. So it's about awareness and motivation. And we think if we can get the big agencies and the the big corporates to agree to that at this nascent point and almost make it just the way everybody does it, then we shouldn't have a, a lot of those hideous problems which we had um, in social media because of anonymity and because of lack of understanding of, of motivation. Influence, the global podcast that shines a spotlight on the influencer marketing industry. So that's it for another edition of Influence. Please make sure you subscribe and listen to some of the other episodes. You can find them on my website, gordonglenster.com, or the BCMA branded content marketing website too. Always happy to find out about um, topics and guests that you'd like to hear about. Just drop me a line, gordon at gordonglenster.com. So until next time, that's bye from me. Thank you.